I'm Jill. I'm Victor. And we are building a board game. Welcome back to Build a Board Game, a series documenting the creation of a board game from start to finish. In last week's episode, we discussed gameplay. I went over our methods of playtesting as well as the structure of our rulebook. Since then, we have drafted a rulebook that is 85% finished. It's mainly missing the final section of appendices, as a lot of those images and icons still need to be finalized. Otherwise, the parts that have been completed are pretty cohesive, so we have sent off a copy to a handful of beta testers for review. Today's video marks the first of several covering character design. Character design is the physical representation of a person. Strong character design conveys all sorts of information. At first glance, the viewer should get a sense of three base traits. One, demographic. What is the character's gender, age, ethnicity, or in the case of animals and creatures, their species? Two, personality. Are they friendly or closed off? Gentle or aggressive? Smart or not so smart? Three, function. What kind of role do they play in society? Secondary details like color palette, body type, clothing, and props all play a role as well and should be chosen according to the character's three base traits. If I were making something in which characters are being viewed in multiple scenarios and angles, like a comic, animation, or video game, I would definitely make a model sheet like this. This example of a model sheet shows the main character of the movie Atlantis, Milo Thatch. It was drawn by animator John Pomeroy, who worked with both Don Bluth and Disney, and is currently a freelance artist. Here we see Milo in many different angles, poses, facial expressions, and outfits. We can infer that he is a young man, likely in his 20s or 30s. He looks mild-mannered and somewhat dorky, though not a total pushover, as a more assertive side can be seen in the top right images. Based on his clothing and props, he could be a college student or even an inventor. Model sheets are fantastic, but for the purposes of a board game, all of that work would be overkill. Most board game characters are reduced to a single image appearing on a card. If they're lucky, they might even feature on the box. My end goal is to have one usable image per character, which in of itself can be a double-edged sword. On one hand, it means significantly less work, but on the other, I only get one shot to make a good impression. I've been feeling a lot of pressure surrounding this. Like most artists, I deal with imposter syndrome quite often. There's this nagging feeling in the back of my brain constantly telling me that I'm not good enough. And as much as I trust my husband's judgment as the game designer, he doesn't exactly have the skills or experience of an art director to guide me. So really, I'm on my own. This mental block can be quite the obstacle, so here are some of the things I've been doing in order to overcome it. A good way of getting out of my head has been looking at the work of artists I admire. I started by looking at mediums other than board games. This is the official art book for Studio Ghibli's Howl's Moving Castle, one of my all-time favorite films. These sections display the early designs of the main characters and supporting cast, all hand-drawn by Hayao Miyazaki and his team. Another big source of inspiration is Full Metal Alchemist by Hiromu Arakawa. I've seen the anime multiple times, but I've only just recently finished reading the entire manga series for the very first time after collecting a special edition set. At the end of each volume, Arakawa included the initial concept sketches for the character that features on the cover. It's so fascinating to see how some characters look completely different from their first designs, while others look exactly the same. Now you might think this exercise of looking to artists whom I highly respect and pretty well idolize might psych me out, since comparing oneself to the greats can be a recipe for disaster. However, I found it to be incredibly motivating. 
Seeing their messy, unpolished concept sketches relieved a lot of the pressure that I have been placing on myself. So, hooray for that! Moving on to artists who actually work in the board game space, two who really stick out to me are Alexander Diachon and Dustin Faust. Or Faust, I'm not sure. <laughs> Diachon's human designs are extremely varied in body type and facial expression. Foust, on the other hand, has a really cool grasp of drawing anthropomorphized animals and really creative, imaginative monsters. While I by no means aim to copy these artists, I certainly look to their work for inspiration. Finally, I think it's important to note the artists who have really helped me with my technical skills over the years. I am considered a self-taught artist because I never went to art school, so these guys are my unofficial professors. Stan Prokopenko taught me all of the basics for human anatomy. His YouTube channel Proko is an absolute goldmine of knowledge that I highly recommend to any beginner artist. Another art teacher I have followed for a long time is Marc Brunet, founder of the YouTube Art School. In fact, I am currently enrolled in his self-study art class. His teachings have helped me level up by honing my line work and pushing me to go for more dynamic posing. You can bet that I will be referring to both of these art teachers as resources throughout this entire project. Now, I could spend all day admiring other artists and watching drawing tutorials, but eventually I need to do some actual work. For me personally, the best way to loosen up is through gesture drawing. I use two websites for this, Quick Poses and Line of Action. Both websites have a library of poses that can be set to a timer. I tend to use Line of Action's class mode set to 30 minutes, which cycles through a variety of poses in different time intervals. This practice gets my muscles and joints properly warmed up so I don't feel so stiff. After a round of gesture drawing, I am ready to take a look at our character mood boards. A mood board is basically a collection of inspiration photos, similar to a traditional scrapbook or a Pinterest board. We have a Google Sheets file with all of the written character descriptions, but for something visual like character design, a spreadsheet is far too cumbersome, hence the mood boards. Victor originally made them on Google Docs, but we recently moved to a website called Milanote. Just like Google Docs, Milanote is free collaborative, and easy to use, but for the purposes of a mood board, we find it much more intuitive. This is what the interface looks like. On the left-hand side, there are tools for creating notes, links, and to-do lists. You can even insert videos, color swatches, and audio files. As you can see, we have our characters divided into three categories. Now in the last video, you may remember that I mentioned mages and meat shields. But I completely forgot about the third category, meet mages, which are meant to be hybrids between the two. I further organize them on a scale of humanoid to creature. The characters on the left are human or human adjacent, like elves, halflings, dwarves, etc. Towards the middle, you get characters that are somewhere in between, like orcs, genies, and werewolves. On the right hand side, we have full on creatures such as animals a rock monster, and even an eldritch abomination. I have very little experience with drawing creatures, so I plan to start with characters on the humanoid side and eventually make my way to the right. A fun feature of Milanote is that I can assign icons to boards that best represent each character. They have also been color-coded based on how complete their individual mood boards are. A completed board should include their name, subtitle, and powers, inspiration photos, reference photos for posing and clothing, and a short list of adjectives to describe their personality. At this stage, it's a bit too early to decide on color palettes, but it will be something to consider in the near future. All of this groundwork is being done by Victor, which makes my job a whole lot easier. We're going to take a look at Malt, one of the only characters that I've actually sketched to date. As you can see, all of the information I need is there. I can see that his name is Malt. His subtitle is A Bottle of Gin. 
These are the names of his two powers and a bunch of photos to help me figure out what he might look like. Oh, and there's also a short list of adjectives. Unfortunately, I recycled the original piece of paper where I drew three different thumbnail sketches based on the poses found in this mood board. So can't really show you that. The good news is that I kept my very messy sketch on the digital file. Once Victor and I settled on a pose and a composition that we really liked, I did another pass of sketching to refine it. This sketch is much more defined and has extra details on the clothing, hair, and accessories. I still felt like it was missing something, at which point Victor suggested a more magical element. That's when we came up with the idea of the liquid being poured in a way that defied gravity and added to the whimsy. I then chose a handful of colors for the palette, blocked them in, added a transparent wash for the liquid, and then tested out a very basic background. So this image is very, very far from the final version. But I made the decision to stop here and refrain from moving forward. This is because I don't want to go too far ahead and make big decisions in the rendering phase, like deciding on what brushes to use or how detailed the line art will be. Because if I change my mind later on, all of that work will have been for nothing. My personal art style can go between a very simple, cartoony look and a more detailed, semi-realistic style. So that decision will be something for future me to worry about. Instead, I will do the drawings in batches to preserve a sense of cohesion. I will be starting with thumbnails, which are very small and messy and are meant for exploring composition and posing. Sketches have more detailed line art, and then later on, full-on renders, which would include clean ink lines, color, shading, lighting, and a background. Next time, I will be getting into my process for thumbnail sketching, and maybe even take a few of those thumbnails into the more detailed sketch phase. There, I will refine lines and make choices such as clothing details, facial expressions, and props. See you then! Thank you.